Okay, filming. Okay, good. Okay. Great. Hey everyone, so we're actually not fishing today, but I'm just as excited because today um, I'm spending a bit of time with my good friend and colleague, um, Dr. Eric Taylor, or Rick. Um, you're actually one of my former instructors at UBC, and uh, right. it's good to be back. I <laughs> uh, haven't been back here for over 10 years, so it's nice to come back uh, for a visit. And we're going to have a little conversation about um, fisheries and uh, the state of law fisheries in BC and uh, some of your work. Sure. And uh, it'll be quite interesting, so stay tuned. And uh, well, before we get into the really heavy stuff, I think what we should talk about is, um, you know, fishing. You, you do fish quite a bit too, Yes, right? I, I do. Yeah. Well, and mostly, what kind of mostly interior lake and stream fishing. Okay. But some on, some on the coast for... Things like bull trout in the Squamish and okay. stuff like that. Yeah, so fly, mostly fly fishing. Mostly fly fishing, think. but yeah. some trolling for lake trout for sure. Okay, yeah. so mostly trout and yep. you don't do a whole lot of salt water fishing? Uh, no, no, although I, yeah. our youngest son is a guide. Oh, really? Up okay. at uh, Duncanby. Okay, nice. Uh, so he yeah. he has all the fancy equipment. Yeah, and nice. the real expertise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very, right, very. Right. And what would be like your, your favorite species to catch? And oh, boy. <laughs> uh, well, I'd, I'd have one. to say probably Arctic grayling. Yeah. Oh, really? Um, okay. Yeah, they, they take the dry fly very willingly, mm -hmm. and they're just in beautiful areas yeah. of northern northeastern BC and, and Yukon, and right. It's 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 more a mix of the fish and the landscape, but but it's hard to say because I hate to put them on any. I, I love catching uh, big lake trout as well that right. you know aren't great jumpers or anything, but any fish that lives that deep in the water yeah. and comes up and is eating other fish is pretty okay in my books. Right. Okay. Nice. Yeah. 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 And um, so let's talk about you know, your, your, your studies. So what, what fish species do you specialize in? Uh, I specialize mostly in um, non-salmon, trout, grayling, okay. char, okay. Uh, and a lot of non-game fish, um, uh, long-nosed dace, suckers, sticklebacks, right. that sort of thing. Yeah. Mostly interested in uh, looking, using genetics to answer questions in ecology and also applying it to conservation questions. So we do a lot of, a lot of applied work with um, uh, resource agencies, BC Fisheries, uh, Alberta, uh, uh, BC Hydro, things like that, okay. and consultant companies. So, right. so I'm really interested in applying these techniques to actually help people answer questions on the ground. Right. And, and those, and your findings are used in, when it comes to management? Oh, very much so. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, we we were sort of the first ones to develop, say, molecular tools to differentiate uh, Dolly Varden and bull trout. Right, I remember that. Yeah. Uh, back in the mid '90s, yeah. associated with mine development, and yeah. consultants would say, "We don't, we can't tell if these are Dolly Varden mm -hmm. or bull trout. Can you help us?" And it turns out there are actually both of them and the hybrids there. So okay, and that yeah. was applied directly to the compensation programs. Yep. Yeah. I remember collecting samples for you, DNA samples That's for right. you, yep. um, in the in the lower Fraser. For sure. And it turns out most of the samples I got were actually bull trout. That's right. And I Definitely. think there were a few hybrids in there as well, mixed. In um, yeah. not so much not so down much here. Yeah. Um, yeah, we worked on the. Uh, yes, it's not, you remind me, you you provided and other people provided. Yeah. A char caught in the lower Fraser, mm -hmm. and uh, so we collected th from fish from there, uh, the Squamish, the Pit, etc. And then sort of did a, uh, an analysis to figure out where most of these fish that people are catching in Lower Fraser, where do they actually emanate from? Right. And by far the, the most were from the pit. Okay. Uh, yeah. Which is not surprising, but we got a few that were clearly had come from the Squamish, come along the coast and diddled around in the Lower Fraser. Right, right. So. I actually get asked quite a bit um, if, if these fish are actually Dolly Vardens or bull trout, and I uh, tend <laughs> to say that they are bull trout. Yeah. Um, are there any Dolly Vardens in, in, the, in the Fraser River drainage? Uh, um, Yes, there are, uh, or, or I would say in the Fraser River drainage, um, if there are, they're mostly in small headwater streams uh, and they will not, typically not go to sea. So you might yeah. get them in, in tributaries uh, in say the Harrison River, or right. the Harrison Lake, the flow into Harrison Lake. Uh, but any of the big fish that are swimming around in that lake or using the river that are going to sea are, are bull trout. Right. But, but where, where Dolly Varden and bull trout do not occur together, of course, everyone knows who fishes for on the island. For instance, Dolly Varden will go to sea like crazy. Right. But any big fish you're catching in a coastal stream here is a bull trout, not a right, Dolly Varden. Right. That's amazing how you can have different locations and, and the life history is so different. 
totally. when it, you know, to, you're talking about Dolly Vardens in on the mainland and Vancouver Island, they, they have completely different. That's right. Uh, and and why, why are there no bull trout on Vancouver Island? Yeah. They could easily swim there. Yeah. Uh, and there, I've seen the first marine pictures of bull trout swimming around the marine environment from this new book by Tom Quinn at UW. And there's like hundreds of them. Yeah. They could easily get there. Yeah. And they're swimming around the, the, the uh, San Juan Island. So yeah. why didn't they get to Vancouver Island? Yeah. And every fish we've ever looked at on Vancouver Island is a Dolly Varden. Right. Uh, That's amazing, yeah. It, it is amazing. And the, uh, the other really cool thing is if you go into Alaska where we do work on Arctic char and Dolly Varden, it's the same thing. Right. It, 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 but in that case, it's the Dolly Varden that go to sea, and mm. it's the Arctic char that sticks strictly to the lakes. Right. Very strange. Right. Hmm. Interesting, yeah. There's, there's so many unanswered questions that there's so much research that still needs to be done, right? Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, so the, the point of this conversation is we're going to be talking about the Fraser River fisheries. Because um, as everyone knows, in the last decade or so, um, the, the, the fishery has kind of declined, mm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, I fished in the Fraser since the mid-90s, and the fishing now is incomparable committed, you know, committed 20 years ago. It's, yeah. it's, just, it's, it's just nowhere like it used to be, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, we have plenty of problems, not just in one particular species, but several different species. Yes. Um, so. Let's talk about the Chinook salmon first, sure, I guess. Um, sure. That's been in the media quite a bit, mm -hmm. um, especially the early Fraser Chinook salmon. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the challenges that we, we're facing right now when it comes <laughs> to the, the, the Fraser Chinooks, wow. the early Chinooks, yeah? Um, well, it, particularly as you say, the early run Fraser Chinooks, the biggest challenge, well, there's two, two challenges. One is largely out of our control, and yeah. that's uh, changes in the o ocean conditions right. that are in impacting survival. Mm -hmm. um, so it's either a, 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 a changes in temperature that affect the, the sort of physiology, physiological performance of the fish, changes in temperature that impact the distribution of prey that they can they feed on or the distribution of predators are going to eat them. There's something going on in the ocean and this is persistent in steelhead, chinook and coho where the, uh, the survival from the time they leave the rivers to the time they came back to the rivers as adults has declined dramatically and, right. and fluctuates. And, and so returns, even if exploitation in fisheries is cut back, commercial fisheries is cut back, the productivity of those populations is, 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 is it's declining. It's on decline, okay. So, yeah. you know, how do you change conditions in the ocean? Right. You, you really can't on any short term. Right. So that's the, really the biggest challenge. Uh, the, the other challenge that's, to me, is really, really Im important is just the lack of action that we're getting from uh, some uh, some aspects of sort of federal jurisdiction uh, to to preserve these these populations. And right. conservation is the highest priority, and we have a Species at Risk Act, and people have been assessing uh, Pacific salmon and trout of uh, at at risk of, at some level of risk of extinction since the early 2000s, mm -hmm. and not one has ever been listed. No, there's now more than probably 50 right. that have been assessed by, by the committee that does this sort of thing as at some risk of extinction, and not one has received legal protection under the Species at Risk Act. Right. Yep. So all the machinery that comes in after that, uh, uh, prohibitions against harming or killing them, um, that destroy, uh, wrecking the habitat, and the, the actual action that the province and the feds ha get together to generate a recovery plan to actually see more fish on the spawning grounds. And that's really the bottom mm -hmm. line. We want to see more fish in the spawning grounds. And then we can start exploiting them again. Yeah. That whole machinery that will do that and is accountable to the public is stalled. It's just not happening. Right, right, right. Is there a fast track track process to this? Would the hatchery production help in this case? Uh, I, I think in some cases, hatchery production can help. Um, but remember, there's lots of evidence that uh, hatchery fish, of course, don't survive as well in the wild. And if they interbreed with, with a wild-produced fish, then those offspring don't do well in the, yeah. all the sorts of different environments. So it's certainly not a quick fix by any means. Right. It, it can be part of a multi-strategy recovery plan, mm -hmm. maybe a, a, a quick demographic boost that you monitor and then scale back. Right. Uh, but, but hatchery production without improving uh, uh, mortal uh, survival conditions in the ocean, some of which we might have some control over. I'm going to mm -hmm. take back a few words. This right. has to do with predation. Right. 
by, by pinnipeds and things. Mm -hmm. um, but unless we do that, hatchery production isn't going to do anything. And right. it may actually make it even worse because you're just going to increase the number of fish out in the Pacific Ocean. Right. Uh, hatchery fish, which are going to compete with the wild fish, which is identified as a potential right. threat to, uh, right. to uh, wild produced fish. Right. Right. Well, I think I think the definition of sustain sustainability it's a little different when it comes to from the, from the anglers' point of view mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to to a scientist's point of view like yourself yep. because to to anglers um, sustainability means quantity means yep. a lot of fish. Yep. The more fish we have, the the better the healthier the population is. Uh, but that's not so. necessarily the case. Would you say? No, I mean? it, it's definitely not the case, and and I subscribe to that definition of mm -hmm. sustainability. Uh, you know, I think of sustainability in a, in, a, in a broader sense. I mean, there's, there's no, people value fish for different ways. Right. I would give up all fishing right now, mm -hmm. as of five minutes from now, if I thought that that would preserve uh, or, or, or would, would encourage uh, the fantastic array of salmon and trout populations that British Columbia is literally world famous for. Right. Because that makes me feel good as a British Columbian and as a Canadian. Right. Uh, but I also appreciate that there's other people who say, well, that's fine. You know, it's great to have all these fish swimming around and all that sort of stuff, but I want to be able to exploit them in some way. Right. And, and I think that's totally justifiable and a great reason, another great reason why we need to conserve these fish at, to such a level that we can take some harvest. Right. So right. It, it, I, I don't believe sustainability, it, in certain situations, I subscribe to the sustainability mm -hmm. you, you first articulated. But in general, I think sustainability has to mean a broader thing. Right, right. And the other thing is, you know, the other thing I've been working in this industry for quite a while now, you know, I do believe that, you know, if, if people don't use it, they, they wouldn't care about it. Oh, totally. Right. Yeah. So if you don't have anglers fishing for them, um, you know, we, we're going to walk away and, you know, nobody's going to be speaking up for the fish. That's right. Oh, right? That, that's, very, that's very true. Right. If so, you don't know it, you're not going to care about it. And right. if you don't care about it, then... They're going to go. Exactly, yeah. So that's Someone else is going to use that habitat to build a shopping mall or to, to for a, a marina or something else. Right. Yeah. If we don't value it for those other reasons. Right. And exactly. part of that value is, is using those things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that's part of the reason that, you know, I guess there's so much talk right now about the, the fishing closures, you know, for Chinook mm -hmm. salmon and, you know, people want to be back on the water. I mean, what, what do you think about that, like, right now? Like, what, what, what would be the right approach? Is, is the current closure approach? You know, we're getting a little political here, but yeah, is yeah. the current approach the, the right way to go about it? Or is, is, it, is it a different way that we can do that, that will please, that will be a better balance, you know, to preserve the population and yeah. the, the uh, angling community as well? Well, I think you know, we were talking about this yesterday with this, this uh, parliamentary committee I was asked to, to be a witness at. And we were talking about closures of the interior Fraser River steelhead mm -hmm. and some of the MPs were asking me, well, you know, how, you can't tell a rainbow trout from a steelhead, so, uh, you know, you're going to forego all these opportunities to catch rainbow trout just to save these steelhead. And, you know, I sort of went out on a, on a limb and I said, I bet you that if you closed all fisheries in the areas affected by Thompson and Chilcotin River steelhead on rainbow trout, or at least made them catch and release for a set time period and mm -hmm. gave people a, an articulated a plan to say, this is how we're going to monitor the effect uh, this is how we're going to determine whether it worked or not, and this is what we're going to do if it didn't or did not work. I bet you virtually every angler would say, I'll give up fishing for, for five or ten years. If yeah. you can promise me, there'll be an empirical way, and people will be accountable for what happens. Right. So I, I think closures can be, part of the mm -hmm. can be part of the solution, for sure, right. but they have to go hand in hand with other things that people can say, because we're all going to have to pay for this, for sure. Right. We're all going to have to yeah. sacrifice. But I totally agree, and as I said, I have a, I have a son who, who works in the, in the fish guiding industry, and they're a bit further north than the areas that are affected by closures. But I realize that people's lives are going to people are going to be being asked to sacrifice for this, yeah. and people will do that if they think they're going to get something better out of the end. Yeah. But if it's just yeah. you know one thing, a reactionary approach, and they can't see because the integrated fisheries management plan is 500 pages long, yeah. and they can't figure out where they they fit in this. And, and they can't see a clear path to how this is going to put more fish on the spawning grounds, right. which is the critical thing everybody wants to see. Mm -hmm. That is the result that will generate support for these types of things. Right. But if it's not articulated, I can understand right. why people are upset about it. And that's a good point. I mean, that's totally what's happening right now, right? I mean, the anglers are not totally happy about it because we're not being prom promised a measurable result 
in five years from now, yeah. 10 years from now. Yeah. Um, the closure right now kind of means closure forever, yeah. right? So yeah. that's... And you can't, I mean, obviously, and you know as a biologist, bio, with biological training, you can't promise people no. that the result will be positive in the end. Right. But at least if you can make the system accountable mm -hmm. and you can, you, can have, you can articulate specific goals that will determine success or not, I think most reasonable people would go for that. Right. They'll give it a, because we've gotten so much into these salmon and trout, let's give them a break for a while, mm -hmm. see what happens, and then move forward from that. Right. But right. if someone, if, if, I'm, if I have to pay for something and no one else has to, of course I'm going to be upset about it. Right. Particularly if I can't see a, uh, you know, that something, I, I can't be certain that there's an objective way to determine whether something's good is going to come out of the other end. Right, right. So let's talk about the interior of Fraser Steel here for one second. So Thompson sure. and Chocolate and Steel yep. here, that's been, we've been talking about this for the last two years, mm -hmm. how the number has declined to the level that's, you know, unimaginable. It's, it's down to a couple hundred fish mm -hmm. when it or used to be a lower, yeah, lower than a hundred yep. fish, right? Um, which at one point, you know, will, will be like a, high number 3,500 3, fish so we're down to looking at less than 10 percent of the yeah, yeah. what the population once and, was and remember in the case of the thompson river steelhead that's an aggregate mm -hmm. so i think the last estimate was 177 that's distributed amongst four spawning streams right so any one of those major spawning streams has a lot lower than 177 yeah, could be a couple dozen a couple of like dozen that. yep yeah so so is that hope still <laughs> <laughs> Same species. Um, well, well, I'm optimistic in the yep. sense that if we have the will to actually do the things that are necessary, yep. there's no question they'll come back. Right. No uh, question. And, w and what are those things that are necessary? Um, well, they need to be listed under the Species at Risk Act, mm -hmm. so that that will that will kickstart the entire recovery process. That itself is a bit more accountable than stuffing some changes into a 500-page integrated fisheries management plan that deals with all sorts of different species. Right. Um, uh, so, you know, definitely, definitely closure of, of interception gillnet fisheries, mm -hmm. uh, particularly the ones in the lower Fraser. Right. Uh, and, and maybe the ones off the west coast of Vancouver Island. You know, I'm not, I realize that, that, it, that of course, once thing, something is listed, you can't kill or harm it. So the extreme view would be, well, that's going to shut down every commercial fishery in the entire coast. And I, right. You know, I, I don't believe that's actually true. I, I think we're, I think we could probably come to some solution where we would close commercial fisheries or, or aboriginal fisheries in areas where the, the impact is most severe. Because right now, yeah. every single fish counts. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah. The, the, the Integrated fisheries, fisheries Management Plan states that bycatch mortality for interior Fraser steelhead will be reduced as much as possible. Right. Which is a totally useless statement. It <laughs> should say yeah. it'd be reduced to zero. Zero, yeah. And, and it should be monitored, uh, demonstrated. Right. Reduce as much as possible could mean 1% reduction. Right. Or could be 99%. That's the example of the vagueness because people are handcuffed by all the implications of this. Right. So there, there are trade-offs. I mean, there's, there's going to be sa sacrifices for recreational, aboriginal, and commercial fisheries opportunities. Mm -hmm. But we have to think a little bit more long term and say, well, how is that going to impact the opportunities we're going to have in ten or fifteen or twenty years? Right. You have to you have to think on that time scale. Right. Because yeah. we're we're in a hole right now. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Yeah. So what, one of the issues of being quite vocal about on this partic particular topic is that, you know, last year we had the recreational uh, fishing closure, salmon closure from, I guess September to November, because of the interior phase of steelhead. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of, one of my favorite fisheries is catching coho and bull trout yeah, sure. in the Fraser, right? Um, but, but at the same time, we still have the, the gillnet and yeah. beach sanding fisheries going on for chum salmon, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, do have impact, an impact on the populations. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not necessarily saying that it should be closed completely, mm -hmm. but one of the things that we've been talking about is selecti selectivity. Mm -hmm. There must be other ways to yep. selectively fish for chum salmon, which are high in abundance, mm -hmm. and avoid um, endangered species like steelhead. Yeah, right? well, well, for sure. Um, yeah, so, would, that, so, would that be a right approach for that? Well, I, I, you know, I was, I was at the, there was a selective fishing forum right. in Quitland. Yeah. And, you know, it's very successful, it seems to be very successful in places like the lower Columbia. Right. Uh, and there may be nuances about the, the level of flow or the substrate in the lower Fraser 
that we might not be able to import that method exactly, mm -hmm. but surely it could be tweaked. It, it yeah. should be at least be tried on an experimental exactly, basis. Yeah. You get you get fish with, uh, and th this is just uh, I guess trap nets yep. as opposed to a fish wheel. Trap mm -hmm. nets have like virtually zero bycatch mortality exactly, as far as yeah, I, yeah. I can tell. Uh, yeah. The fish have no net marks on them. You mm -hmm. can get a higher price for them. Mm -hmm. um, so we should be trying that, it, it moving things away from this clearly destructive form of fishing, gill net fishing, right. of marginal economic value, mm -hmm. um, and moving to try, and try new things. We have to be bold and try new things. Right. And yeah. the important thing is when you try something new, is to have some empirical way to evaluate it so that you can actually learn from it. Even if you say, well, pound nets are, or trap nets aren't going to work in the Fraser, and these are the reasons why, and then you see a clear path to move forward to try something else. Right, right. But just to close the fishery with no plan beforehand when fish are still being killed in bycatch mm -hmm. gill nets makes no sense. Yeah, it makes it absolutely it makes no sense. No sense. Yeah. So, what, so what's holding us back from trying those options from the trap nets? Because uh, I wasn't at that meeting, but... But it doesn't sound like it's, it's yeah. Well, well I, moving forward. the thing that's amazing was is I learned at this meeting, and I'm, I might get some of the facts slightly wrong, but apparently this was tried experimentally with either a fish wheel or a or a net in the Fraser, or maybe this maybe some parts of the Skeena, mm -hmm. and you know it's a typical thing where there was funding allocated to do this for five or six years, and there was no plan to evaluate it to see whether this should be a long term. So the funding ended, and it seemed to work. But the funding ended, and there was no plan to renew it, and it died. It just died. So yeah. it actually worked. Yeah. But there was no, no plan. There's no end game. There's right. no after game. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so, so I think, you know, to be honest, and I realized fisheries, as as Norman J. Wilamowski told me, in in fisheries management, there are no biological problems in fisheries management of any consequence right. really, and I think that's basically true. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, sure, a greater understanding of the ocean. Uh, productivity and things like that, but how are you ever going to manipulate the ocean? Right. It's just it's just not going to happen, mm -hmm. in my view. The problems are people problems. Right. So what's holding us back, I think, is uh, a, a structure which is Department of Fisheries Oceans, and I hate to dump on Department of Fisheries Oceans because everybody does. They're an easy target, but they're an easy target because they're a, a, an organization with a conflicted mandate: mm -hmm. conservation, aquaculture production, commercial fisheries, Aboriginal fisheries. Right. You can't have all four of those in one group. All the different director generals or whoever runs those things, they're all fighting with each other, I'm sure, for priorities. I, I, the, the average schmo, which I include myself in this, does not get a sense that they've got a coherent strategy. To uh, They've all agreed on a coherent strategy to get to a certain point, which is to put more fish on the spawning ground. Right. That's what everybody wants. Yep. But you've got this conflicted mandate where you've got aquaculture production, uh, there's some issues with fish farms, You've got commercial fisheries. You've got fisheries as a strategy and reconciliation. They're all working against the fish. Yep. They're all working for humans, different human interest groups. Yep. But they're all actually working against the fish. Yeah, exactly. Is, yeah. That's the problem. Yeah, the priority is not on the fish. It's that, not on the fish. That's kind of the sense I get from going to those meetings. Right? You yep. know, every user group is trying to, you know, trying to, I guess, satisfy the best interest. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We all trying to protect the fish. Yeah. <laughs> but we all trying to get something out of it yep. without changing our way of life as well. Right? Uh, well, and that's that's right. Yeah, yeah, and recreational fishing industry too. I mean, that's that's part of it too, right? Oh, yeah. oh, oh yeah. definitely. Yeah. And I mean, I, I mean, I can't remember. Uh, some of you viewers probably remember when catch and release first came in, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure that was controversial at the time. You know, why can't we kill every fish we catch and all that sort of right. thing? And you know, it, it it takes time to change things, but you know, there's tons and tons of evidence where catch and release has just increased the number of fish people catch and the average size and all that sort of thing tremendously. Yeah. And you know, when it, I mean, I, I I catch fish, I smoke fish, I love to cook fish that I catch, but in the bottom line, we got, we got to ask ourselves, what do we value more? We we value yeah. those fish as living things more than anything. Absolutely. And I, I think if you don't, then I don't really have much sympathy for you. Yeah. Because because they've got just as much a right to be swimming in the water as we do as walking on the land. Right. And we want to be able to use them for various reasons, but there's got to be enough of them so that they can exist in their right. their natural diversity while we use them. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. I mean, one you know, someone that I well, I used to fish with quite a bit, and um, you know, he once said he, he's never regretted releasing a fish, but he has regretted killing a fish in the yeah. past. Oh, that's right? true, yeah. And I think that all of us can 
can kind of relate to that. Oh, oh yeah, and and you know I'm, uh, you know, uh, I, I fish in lots of areas where, where there's catch and release, and I know that despite the catch and release, I know I've killed fish because I, I haven't released them properly. properly. Sometimes yeah. it's impossible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not not it's impossible, but sometimes it's just difficult. You don't do it right. You make a mistake, and the fish dies. And I always feel terrible about that. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's always an impact. You try to minimize that, yep. right? You're trying to do, you know, as, as little damage as you can, That's um, right. you know, to, to the fish. Right? Uh, oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. I yeah. always tell people to try to just do your best. Do, do, right? Just do your best. You know, yeah. enjoy the resource, and, but do your best, mm -hmm. right? So we can save for our kids. Uh, exactly, right? exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and that's who we all, we all learn from someone older than us exactly, at some yeah. point because they had that experience, and we, we need to pass that on to other people. Right, right, yeah. And changes take time, like you say. I mean, you know, this regulation is... And, and people's attitude takes a long time to change, but mm -hmm. you know we, we're kind of running out of time, aren't we? We're, we're kind of running. We're kind of running. We're kind of running out of time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There, yeah. There's a lot of talk. It, it's just it, it's amazing to me how long. I mean, how long these things take. I mean, w w we issued the recommendation for the emergency listing of Thompson and Chilcotin steelhead to the Minister of Environment yeah. and Climate Change over a year ago. Yeah. And there's still no. I still cannot get a clear answer about whether they're going to make the decision. Right. Yeah, that, that's pretty frustrating. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's extremely frustrating. It shouldn't take that long. It, to me, calling it emergency assessment is just a farce. Right. Because, you know, right. If, if I had a heart attack and you called emergency, you'd like to think they're going to get here pretty soon. Yeah. Not in, you know, a month. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Now, with, with steelheads, let's talk about the biology of steelhead a little bit. Um, if I understand correctly, I mean, steelhead are repeat spawn spawners mm -hmm. and like salmon. Mm -hmm. So, so once, once they spawn, as adults and go out into the ocean, will they come back in the following year? Uh, or, or maybe two years, three years? Yeah, um, you know, I, I'm not a steelhead biologist yeah. uh, by any means, uh, but I know from things like, and other things like Arctic char that are, are repeat spawners, they will definitely skip a year. Oh, and and bull trout will skip, okay. skip a year for sure. They won't necessarily come back. Right, the following year, the, but the, the, the following skip a year. year. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So they're looking at some kind of interbreeding between different runs as well, different, age, different, oh, yeah. different year classes. Yeah, oh, for sure, yeah. As well. I mean, so I think that's part of the, you know, part of their, their, you know, you contrast them with pink salmon that all come back at the same time, yeah. and boom, and they're gone. Yeah. Whereas these things have a much more variable life history for these reasons, interbreeding between year classes and things like that. Right. Sometimes most of the fish going out to the ocean are females as opposed to the males, which will stay, Right. Uh, will, will mature in fresh water. So, yeah, I think that's part of their, their way of making a living is just to be sort of jack of all trades in that way. Sort of right, thing. right. So would that make them more adaptable to, to, to the changes to the environment? Uh, um, well, I, I think in it, terms it, of survival. Yeah, it would make them perhaps more resilient in a way you can imagine. Like when the check when the caustic soda spill occurred in the Chequemus that, yeah. River. Yeah. You know, fortunately, uh, they they weren't pink salmon. They weren't all in the air yeah. at one time and got all yeah. wiped out. There were fish that were brothers and sisters were born the same year. Mm -hmm. Some of them came back to spawn that year. Some of them were still out in the ocean. So the next year, after it all flushed out, right. you get fish from the same birth year class right. will be spawning when the river was okay again. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it definitely makes them more resilient. So there's still hope. Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's well, there's still, still hope. hope. Oh, yeah. There's, there's no question that um, if, if you provide the habitat and you stop killing them excessively, yeah. there's no question they'll come back. So let's talk a little about bit about the, um, I guess, the biological relationship between the rainbow trout and the steelhead in the Thompson River. Um, are they pretty closely related um, between the two populations? Uh, well, they're, they're definitely, well, the bottom line is I don't think we really know so, yeah. so much. Okay. So thinking uh, on a broader scale, there are studies that show in some rivers, rainbow trout and steelhead can be genetically different, two mm -hmm. genetically distinct populations. Uh, and that may be because one's above a barrier, or the resident one's above a barrier, the, the sea run run isn't. Uh, you can get other situations where they're spawning in slightly different parts of the river, uh, even though they're not separated by a physical barrier, and they can also be shown to be genetically distinct mm. from one another. There are other situations where they seem to be spawning totally in the same areas, and there's no demonstrable genetic difference. The only difference is you've got some that are this big, and you've got others that are this big right. or smaller. Uh, and we we do know from uh, I don't think from the studies in the Thompson, but there's no really no reason to suspect it to be different from studies in other areas that uh, there are resonant rain th things that people think that are resonant rainbow trout. You look at the otoliths, you can look at the strontium signature, and those fish have a strontium which is much higher in seawater than in freshwater. Right. 
you can look at the strontium signature that's consistent with the idea that that fish actually had a steelhead as a mother. Hmm. So there's no question, and the same with sockeye and kokanee, that kokanee can produce sockeye, and certainly right. sockeye can produce kokanee, and that rainbow trout sometimes will go to the sea, sometimes they won't. So right. they can be very closely related okay. to each yeah. other, but it depends on the particular river you're talking about. Right, right, right. So in this case, I guess the Thompson, this relationship hasn't really been studied enough? As far as I know, it hasn't yeah, been studied. Hasn't been really studied yeah. enough, yeah. So it, it could also possibly be, you know, a lot of offsprings are staying behind. Oh, yeah. Rather than becoming anadromous. Yeah. Um, I mean, one idea people yeah. have, some people put forth is that, well, that actually the, the, the steelhead, the phenotype, the big fish have declined, mm -hmm. but there's actually just as many Oncorhynchus micus in the system. Right. They've just shifted their life history yeah. from an oceanic life history to now staying in the Thompson River totally. Right. And that's a very interesting idea, mm -hmm. but it's, there's no data to support it, I no. don't think. Uh, and that just highlights the fact that that river is not being studied enough. Mm -hmm. Steelhead are not being studied enough. I think there's two provincial biologists right. that cover steelhead exactly, in all of yeah. British Columbia. Yeah. That's yeah. insanity. That's that's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> well, yeah. the entire province. Yeah. The entire province. Yeah. yeah. And 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 then the, the process could possibly be reversed too, right? I mean, maybe the offspring of rainbow trout can produce steelhead. Oh yes, maybe? Yeah, 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 right? for sure. Yeah. I mean, just but but this kind of studies really take time over time, you know, many generations to figure yeah, out. Yeah, right? and I, I believe there's a situation in the in the U.S. a paper that I read where they removed a barrier, mm -hmm. um, and th there was only resident rainbow trout above this barrier, and they removed the barrier, and then steelhead started showing up. Uh, hmm. in the river. So some of those fish became uh, steelhead again. Became steelhead because the, the cost of going downstream yep. uh, it's less now. were less now yeah. because they could actually get to the same spawning site right. because they removed the barrier. Right, right. So yeah, it can, it can happen for yep. sure. So in, in that sense, there's also this, this possible rescue uh, of the anadromous, the sea run form by the, the, the resident form in, in the river. That, that's possible, but mm -hmm. we just don't know, right? We just don't know, yeah. The bottom line right now is, you know, not to get back to, well, I guess to get back to the politics a bit, is as you say, we're in a bit of a hole, yeah. and all, we can sit around and talk about all these niceties, and you know, sure, I could, I could apply for studies from the federal government, $190 million, whatever it was, and do a long-term study, yeah. but I, I think we need to do immediate things now to actually put more fish in the spawning grounds within right. the next, with, within a generation, right? Uh, n not something a long-term study. W those are important too, but we need to do other things too. Right, yeah. So the immediate approach, listing the species as endangered, um, are we looking at closing off fisheries along the way? Well, as well? <laughs> <laughs> uh, potentially, I mean, there are, yeah. there will be consequences yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm just not, convinced that the, the, the immediate knee-jerk reaction is, oh, all the fisheries are going to close, you're not yeah. going to be able to kill a fish, you're not going to be able to look at it, because mm -hmm. it, it, it might harm it. You know, I, I think in the strict interpretation of that, that's true, and mm -hmm. they'd probably hire some lawyer who could probably actually make that, try to make that case. Yeah. But I would like to think that we could come to some, we could nuance that a, a little bit to to not close all fisheries. Yeah. And, and one of the responses I heard is, well, you know, you could, for instance, you could issue allowable harm permits mm -hmm. um, to say, well, we're going to let the fishery go here. You get an allowable harm permit. Sarah provides for that th th that thing. That means you can you can actually in in the strict contravention of the law, you can actually harm the fish because you've got information that show that this this harm will be allowable for various reasons and it won't impact the population necessarily on a long term basis. And and the response is, well, we don't have the data. We'd never be able to do that. We wouldn't be able to open a fishery by giving an allowable harm permit because we don't have the data to actually demonstrate allowable harm right. is okay. Well, I know, but this then provides the opportunity, the stimulus to get people to actually collect those data. Right. Exactly, to actually yeah. see, monitor how many steelhead are caught in these things. Nobody yep. has a clue. Exactly, yeah. There's yeah. no monitoring. There's, there aren't people on the boat saying, uh, you know, this many steelhead were caught or this was this fish was released and this is its mortality. So yep. we're, we're trying to do something in the absence of any information. So, of, of course, people are trying to find solutions that don't, actually change anything because they haven't got any information to try to make a rational decision. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And that, that's one thing we've been trying to point out is that in, in the angling community, you know, the anglers are the data collectors, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, you can utilize so many people to yeah. collect data for, 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 the, the, for the two provincial biologists who are managing yeah. fisheries, right? Look at yeah. the Lower Fraser uh, uh, 
sturgeon, white sturgeon yeah. fishery. Yeah, that's it. It's a, a classic example, example yeah. uh, of, of people collecting fish. And, you know, sure, some of those fish are unquestionably going to die because they've been caught yeah. and photographed and released. But I guarantee you we wouldn't have the data on the numbers there if that hadn't happened. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah. so the goods are always the best. I, I think so, yeah. 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 yeah, so, yeah, I remember, I remember signing the petition for, for, the, um, for the Thompson Steelhead. Oh, yes. And, yes. You know, urging everyone to do it. You know, we, we got thousands of anglers to do it, and then, uh, and then we had the fishery closure last year. Yeah. <laughs> and then everyone was like, "Oh, and we're like, yeah. <laughs> so." Yeah. It, it, well, again, I mean, someone told me, you know, I was at a meeting at the Steelhead Society, and, yeah. and the, the sentiment was, you know, be careful what you wish for. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But again, it, it, people are fooling themselves if they don't recognize that we're going to have to pay a cost for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the point is, people are willing to pay a cost if they're pretty sure that they might at least get a Some, benefit at the end of it. Right. In the medium in the medium to long term. Yeah, totally, yeah. yeah. yeah but, but if you're just asked to pay for something and you have no confidence that it's actually going to do any good, I'd be mad as hell too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally, yeah, yeah. What I've been telling people is that, you know, yeah, the lower freight is closed, um, but this is what we're trying to do. There are many other fisheries to enjoy in the mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. You know, do that in the meantime, you know. Yeah. Maybe we'll get this fishery back eventually. Yeah. And you know there are people working for it. You know, like yourself, and you yeah. know, as a researcher, and like myself as a, as a you know advocate when it comes to pushing for conservation and stuff. And right. Yeah. So, oh, for and, sure. Yeah. Sure. And you know, I I can't emphasize enough. I mean, you know, I was on the, the, I was the chair of the committee on uh, the status of endangered wildlife in Canada, mm -hmm. and you know, talked to lots of politicians and all this sort of stuff. Right. There's nothing that gets their attention more than ordinary people like myself, mm -hmm. like you, like your, your audience, to actually hold their MPs, hold them accountable, send them letters and emails to say, why aren't you doing something about this? Because if the pressure goes off, yeah. they'll just move to somebody, some other group exactly, that's yeah. pressuring them even more. Yeah, that, that's so important. I mean, it's, I think people get overwhelmed by, you know, by, 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 all, the, by all the bad news, yeah. right? By, oh, yeah, for sure. They get pretty overwhelmed by, you know, this fish is closed, this fish is closed. They kind of, okay, I'm looking at, I'm looking to buy a fishing license this year because yeah. there's, there's really no point, you know. The, the fish is gone, and we're done, yeah. right? Yeah. But I think, I think what you point out is really, really, really great because you, you really got to put the pressure on, right? If you want, sure. want to fish again, if you want the fisheries be back, um, you got to, you know, talk to your MPs, write letters. Um, little, every little action helps, right? Oh, definitely. Um, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, because, be, because as, as I say, if, if if they don't get the sense that the public cares about it, right, then they'll just move on to some situation where the people do demonstrate, right. They, you know, and I think I think politicians are getting it in terms of climate change, mm -hmm. um, uh, because the, because I think the public has actually made that uh, at least a, a, a significant portion of the public has made that link that there's something not right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they're willing to to pay for things and change their lifestyle if they convince that it's part of some sort of coordinated effort. Right. Um, and I don't think we're quite there yet with no. species at risk and things. Mm -hmm. um, and and a particularly where, you know, angling, not everybody angles. I'm, I'm not sure there's a couple hundred thousand anglers or something in, in British Columbia. Yeah. So it's a relatively small number of people. Um, and so that means that any individual voice is three times more important. Yeah. Because... Uh, it gets it, it gets just get lost in the dim. It, it is it is actually a really really small group, yeah. and um, I think our voice is really small in comparison to you know all the other issues that are yeah. happening in this province. Right? That's a, what I've been yeah. telling people, right? I mean, yeah. it, it's great that only a handful of people fish for Thompson steelhead, mm -hmm. but when it comes to protecting the steelhead, you know these handful of voices, it, it's hard to make a difference when you know it it, it can be, but. The other thing, the other sort of strategy that I've used is these fish are symbols of what it means to be a British Columbian. Right. Um, and, you know, I drive through the Thompson River Valley all the time. And, you know, I can't personally separate the fish from the river from the surrounding landscape. To me, right. they're all part of a package. Yeah. And if those fish go, uh, it, I mean, I, I'm from Ontario. I moved here in the late 70s. And... I always had a feeling I should be living here in some weird way. Yeah. But boy, if, if these salmon and steelhead go, then the soul of British Columbia, in my opinion, is ripped out. Right. It, it really is. And, and that, it, that, that should not 
that, that, that people, a lot of people who are not anglers feel exactly the same way. Are you sure about that? I mean, I've, I've, I've actually had this conversation quite a few times. You know, do the ordinary British Columbians who don't fish mm. actually have a close relationship with the fish in BC? Uh, well, certainly some do. Yeah. Probably not enough. Um, right. Do they have a close relationship? Do they the actually have a close relationship with um, a Thompson steelhead? Oh, well, yeah. No. I, I, I think the Thompson steelhead are, are um, you know, perhaps not the, well, contrast them with the sockeye salmon mm -hmm. in the Adams River. I mean, thousands of people go there when the, the big run is on at Rudder Cake Hague Park. I bet you most of those people are not anglers. They right. go for the, the na nature right. spectacular. They they go for to see 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 the sockeye. That's right. Yeah. But, but Thompson steelhead, if you don't fish for them, even if you do fish for them mm -hmm. and you're lucky, most people probably don't catch them, mm -hmm. particularly now. You're never going to see one. No, exactly. So right. they're definitely so that's where you, you can get sort of the umbrella effect of that's why I try to generalize it. It's not just Thompson steelhead. Mm -hmm. It's not just a bunch of old anglers who are right. interested in these things. Thompson steelhead are part of a family of fish that go to the soul of what it is to be, at least to me, to be a British Columbian right. and, a, and, a, and a part of a Canadian. So I think it does resonate. I, I take your point totally. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if you can link them to things like sockeye salmon, mm -hmm. uh, particularly where, you know, they have a long, of course, a very, very long history in the commercial fishery and Aboriginal fishery. And just seeing all those people at Rod Arcade Park, you know, when yeah. the big run is on, yeah. it clearly impacts from everything from little tykes like this to people in their 80s, uh, it, it resonates with the public in that way. Right, right. You almost need to put, put them in a the spotlight to almost like a grizzly bear. Or, yeah, that's you know, right. Let's say if the grizzly bears are endangered, yep. you know, it would be a huge public outcry right away, right? That, that, that's right. Um, yeah. And you know, look it's at the grizzly bear, I mean, I mean, really for no rational reason, uh, at least in terms of biological sustainability, they shut the grizzly bear hunting in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. yep. um, there was there was really not much evidence in the Kosiruk reports that hunting was really a major factor. Right. But what so that the hunters and the people who make their living off off uh, hunting grizzly bears, you know, they're even a smaller, much smaller audience than right. the Thompson steelhead. Mm -hmm. And in, in this case, it worked <laughs> against them. Against them, yeah. But here, here you get a, a case where it clearly became unacceptable to apparently the majority of British Columbians to yeah. hunt them. Mm -hmm. Even if it didn't have a biological, didn't do any biological harm, right? And that just shows how these these animals and plants can get deeply set in people's psyche, mm -hmm. and they can really affect change. Right. It, yeah. it, you know, I'm not sure that was the best <laughs> best approach necessarily. <laughs> yeah. You know, fr from a rational resource management standpoint, I, yeah. I'm not sure. No. Yeah. You can make the logical connections mm -hmm. there, but it just shows you how the power the power of lobbying can be. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yes, I, I think that, that covers pretty much uh, what we need to talk about. Cool. <laughs> um, it's 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 fantastic. I I want to talk about the um, the the biodiversity museum. Yes, yes, please. Um, do. Yeah. Fantastic place. Opened in two thousand and ten, I believe. Yes. Um, that was actually my very first time camp coming here, and I haven't been here in the last nine years, and it, it's it's great. It's we haven't. It, it, you know, it's got a huge collection of mm -hmm. specimens and stuff, and you're the director for uh, I am, yeah. for the museum, yeah. right? Um, maybe just talk a little bit sure. about it. Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, it's the Beattie Biodiversity Museum. It's it's twenty thousand square feet, which is I don't know. It's, it's huge. about the size of a football field, I guess. Yeah. Where we've got two point one million specimens, everything from fossils to the biggest blue whale skeleton, uh, articulated blue whale blue whale skeleton in Canada, uh, and and these represent and and of course almost a million fish specimens. These represent collections from UBC uh, that were at one point all isolated from one another and separate that go back to over 100 years. Wow. Yeah. So it's sort of a, the coalescence of all these collections but a central a place that's uh, open to the public. Uh, there's, there's a fee, of course, yeah. um, but we, we often make accommodations in that way. But it's, it's, part, of, and it's part of a very large uh, K-12 to public education program mm -hmm. about the value of biodiversity in British Columbia and the world. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a great spot. I invite people to come out. Uh, if you like fishes, I'm happy to give you a personal tour of the <laughs> fish collection, yep. which is, my, of course, my favorite part. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, me too, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, it's great. Um, what do you hope people get out of this uh, when they come visit the museum? Uh, well, really, I, I hope they, they get two things. One is just the awe factor. You know, mm -hmm. oh, my goodness, I had no idea there were so many different types of this or so mm -hmm. many types of that or that UBC had collected so many of these things. Right. And 
I hope that they realize that uh, biodiversity is something worth uh, preserving, and I hope they understand why we've th these things have been collected over the uh, over a hundred years, and um, sort of the, the type of work that people at UBC do, uh, often in partnership, lots of times in partnership with people off campus, uh, into uh, trying to understand how biodiversity originates and why it's important to conserve it mm -hmm. for the present and future generations. Fantastic, yeah. I, I definitely have to come back with my kids. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah the, they, they love it. We've got a giant uh, dinosaur uh, dinosaur trackways from the Peace River area that you can touch. You know, you can put, you put your yeah. hand in it, and yeah. of course, the footprint is this big. Yeah, and that's one thing I kind of noticed. Is, is, is very uh, kid-friendly as well. It's very kid-friendly, yeah, yeah. it's, it's very scientific, but it's very kid-friendly yeah. as well. It's easy for them to digest. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah for sure. In. I mean, we have a very, we have a, a we have a, Staff here of about 25, a superb public education team that are, that are Excellent. much more articulate and more energetic <laughs> and a lot younger yeah. than me, <laughs> and they design all these things. Uh, and you can get we have we have these things called beady boxes that have like there'll be a marine life teaching plan in it. I've seen the beady boxes. Yeah, and yeah. you can get those sent to schools and things. <laughs> yeah. So it's great to see like 50 kids running around the grass field out here, mm -hmm. uh, learning about biodiversity and also learning about what we do at UBC yeah. because that's important. You know, what do the people do way out there? Well, yeah, this is great. some of the stuff we do. Excellent, yeah. And we'll put the uh, link of the museum at the very bottom so you can check it out and it has all the information in there for you. And uh, yeah. it's also, it's free every th uh, third right. Thursday every of every month. Thursday evening, yeah. yeah. Thursday evening, yeah. Well, thanks, Rick. And that You're was more than great. welcome, Rob. Yeah. It was great to see it's, you and uh, chat with you. I hope um, you guys got lots of information out of that um, about the Fraser River Fisheries and um, actually appreciate uh, what the work that's being done behind the scene. And, uh, and we should all be working together in the next uh, near future and right on and hopefully we can bring this fish back so I think we can if we have the will excellent thank you thank you <laughs>